Welcome to the Carolina Panorama Spotlight, where we ask the most client-demanding questions. Welcome back to the Carolina Spotlight. I'm your host, Ebony Christie, with the Spotlight series designed for professionals and industry experts to answer the most pressing questions and issues that most consumers have today. Today, I'm sitting next to Mr. Dominique Mjartin of Optus Bank, who has over 20 years of experience in the banking industry. Welcome to the spotlight. It's a pleasure to have you today. I know that there's a ton of people who have a lot of questions, so we're just going to jump right in. I want to first say that um, I had a pleasure walking in this morning. We have a beautiful facility, so congratulations in that regards. Um, but how does a young man from the Czech Republic move to America um, and basically run a black home? very long story so i'll try to make it very brief but um i had the great fortune of growing up in a family that always uh, educated us about the world and even though we grew up in communism my parents were very well educated and had traveled the world prior to uh, the, the communist regime really cracking down on that uh, opportunity so i always uh, dreamed about what it would be like to live in a free country mm -hmm. and um, jokingly, uh, uh, people ask me, you know, you seem like you're uh, more American than a lot of Americans, and I say, I think I was born American just in the wrong country, and I still feel that way. I feel like um, this is the greatest, most powerful um, country in the world, uh, but also I feel strongly that we need to make sure it's truly equitable and fair in providing opportunities to all people, not just a few select ones. So what brought me to Optus Bank and brought, brought me to banking, community development banking in particular, is my desire to make sure that, that uh, the United States is the country that I believe it once was, uh, or I believe it could be, if it were to provide fair and equitable opportunities to all people, regardless where they are um, in terms of their inherited privilege. So I believe that my journey to Optus Bank is really building on my own journey and, uh, and the belief that we need to make sure every person in America has a chance to live a healthy and productive life. And I think mission-driven banks, particularly minority-owned banks, black-owned banks, play a critical role. So the work that we do at Optus Bank and the reason I'm here is not to run a bank. It's to really empower people to build wealth, build generational wealth, transformational wealth. And I believe that Optus Bank is a vehicle to do that. In fact, one of the ways that inside the bank we describe what we do is that we really are part of a wealth building ministry that happens to have a bank versus a bank that does some good in a community. Uh, we want to really be wealth builders for our community that has been left behind for 400 years. And we are fortunate to have a bank as a tool to do that. Now, first and foremost, we have to run a really strong and, and profitable bank, but we have to do it with intent to close the racial wealth gap. And so that's why I'm here uh, for that sole purpose, not to be a banker, but to really be someone who enables everyone to live the American dream that I've been fortunate to live. I think it's awesome that you are um, aware of like, a lot of the issues that happen here in America and that you are trying to change that. Um, so when the South Carolina community or the South Carolina community uh, became out this. I know that a lot of um, African Americans were afraid that it would no longer be considered black owned. Um, so, how has the ownership composition changed? Yeah. And that's a fair question. Um, I think out of the 18 black owned banks in America today, um, we're probably the only one that's, that's run by a white guy, especially a white guy from Czechoslovakia for sure. Um, so, I don't take that lightly. I think it is important to acknowledge and be very candid about. You know, our mission is to close the racial wealth gap. And I happen to be fortunate to be part of that mission. Um, the bank is, as it has been for over 100 years, black owned. Majority of our African American uh, shareholders are still with us. And majority of the voting control of the bank, tr people who truly run the bank, who hired me to be part of their journey, part of their mission, to be a steward of their investment, are majority African American. And we intend to keep it that way. In fact, our board mate has, a, has made a very deliberate decision 
to ensure that as the bank continues to grow and we continue to raise capital, uh, just to put it in perspective, um, I came here in 2017, we had about less than five million in total equity, shareholder equity. The shareholder wealth was less than five million, maybe four and a half million. Today is almost 40 million. But the question that should be asked and must be asked as we look at the mission and preserving the mission and the commitment of this institution to close the racial wealth gap should be who is actually controlling that wealth? Who is actually controlling the institution? And in our case, it's squarely majority African-American control and we intend to keep it that way. Uh, in fact, we intend to keep it that way as long as we can. Um, so that's our, um, that's, a, that's the, I guess the simple answer is, is the voting common equity continues to be and is controlled by African-Americans. Um, the, the more long answer, I guess the longer answer, is and then the question we ask is not necessarily just who controls it, but what does it mean for our community? It, does that mission of the bank that was started almost 100 years ago by very courageous African-Americans, does that mission still live on? The question I ask myself is not necessarily who just owns the bank, which is important, but you could have you could have a, a bank that's owned by African Americans that does no good for the community, right? It could be just a for-profit bank. You could have any business that's black owned and may not carry out any mission purpose in the community. In our case, we want to make sure that we are true to our mission. And so let me explain the mission that will make more sense. The mission of our bank is to create wealth. And the way we create wealth is by helping all key stakeholders, starting with our community. We want to make sure that we're intentional about injecting capital into our community. And what I mean by our community is everyone in our community, but especially those that have been excluded for too long. Um, over the last four years, we've brought over $250 million into South Carolina from outside of the state. We're bringing wealth to our community. So that's number one a stakeholder, not in order of priority, but in order of sequencing for this purpose is community. Number two is our customers. Are we helping customers build wealth? Are we seeing customers that start with a net worth of zero or negative and five or 10 or 20 years later, do they have a house? Do they have a business? Do they have equity in their home? Do they own permanent multi-generational assets that can be transferred on? Because we know in America, even though I still believe it is the greatest um, country in the world with the greatest opportunity to build wealth, we know most of the wealth is inherited, it's not made. And so number two stakeholders is our customers. Are we helping them move up the socioeconomic ladder? Are they better off after working with us? Are we helping them every time they walk through our door and they leave better off than when we found them or they found us? That's the key question. Number three, our employees. Are we creating employment opportunities and wealth building opportunities for people that have historically not worked in banking? If you go look around this building and look at our team, our management team, we're very intentional about grooming talent from the ground up. We have several interns right now that would never have thought about banking, but we've recruited them intentionally. In fact, two or three of them have full-time jobs with us today that started out as interns. So are we building the wealth in our community through opportunities in industry that would not historically have been as welcoming to African-Americans? And the answer is yes, and we continue to do that. Number four is our shareholders. And that's where the ownership is important. The ownership is important because it does signify to the community and to our mission who owns the bank is important because the owners have a lot of say about what the bank does. In our case, we're a majority black owned, and like I said, we intend to keep it that way forever. But we also are in the business of creating wealth for our shareholders because the majority of them with voting common equity happen to be African-American. So to wrap it all up, if you look at what is the core mission of our bank, the core mission is to build wealth. It is to build wealth for our community, for our customers, for our employees, and for our shareholders. It is not to build wealth 
for one of those stakeholder groups over another. It is to build wealth for all four groups. What has been the community's response to what you've done here so far? Well, initially, I think it is fair to acknowledge there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, the bank, uh, the bank struggled historically, off and on, but the bank also did a tremendous amount of good, and I think the community wanted to see that that good was preserved and amplified. But rightfully so, you know, you have. A new name, you have a white guy coming in that's perceived, um, you know, to signify change in the mission of the bank. And so I've been here a little over four years. And what I always ask people is don't judge me by the way I look or how I sound. Look at the performance of the bank, look at what we're doing in the community. Don't take my word for it, look at the results. I would say it would be an understatement to say, with amazing courage and commitment, decided to recapitalize the bank post the 2009 recession. He believed this institution could not just survive, but can thrive. And so Chairman Mitchell and the rest of the directors joined really, uh, even post uh, recession, started investing their own capital to preserve the bank and also started to build a base on which the bank can stand and it stands today. So. Uh, what I want to make sure is that we, we communicate clearly that the bank is based on that foundation of these very courageous and committed African-American leaders. So I don't take that lightly. Um, and I acknowledge that. You know, I acknowledge that's our founding DNA. That's in our DNA. The people that founded and established this bank and preserved it are the people that I work for. Um, I don't work for our new investors. I'm grateful to have them, but when I show up, I'm working for our community that we want to serve. But last year, over 90% of our loans were invested in, in three types of businesses or homes. Majority black owned, majority African American homes or women owned businesses, and over 60% in low income communities. So let the numbers speak for themselves. We are accomplishing our mission, one, by growing our impact positively in our communities that we want to serve. We're also accomplishing it by making sure that that impact is channeled intentionally to underserved businesses, underserved people, or people that have historically been excluded. Do we do everything perfectly? No. Are we experiencing growing pains? Yes. Are we struggling to make sure that we are truly, truly amplifying our impact every day? The question we ask ourselves every day, how can we do more for our communities? How can we do more for our mission? How can we make sure that every person that walks through the door whether it's that door or the virtual door today in banking, a lot of the transactions are virtual or digital. When they leave us, they leave us better off than when they found us. So we're challenging ourselves every day to accomplish the mission. But again, those are just words. Look at the results. Shifting gears a little bit, um, besides people wanting to know the office bank story, um, people also want to know how banking works. Um, so the question that I have is how do banks calculate fees? Well, it depends on what kind of fees. Um, so let me let me back up for a minute. Um, maybe it would be helpful to just share how banks make money. Period. So, so historically, most community-based institutions like ours, and institutions also to clarify that are accountable to their local community, right? community that really has influence over us, they behave a little bit differently than some of the larger banks right? because we're accountable. Because I see people in the community uh, that bank with us, and so I want to make sure that we're a little more connected and we serve them. So I'm focusing strictly on how community banks have historically made money and continue to make money today. So we um, collect deposits and protect and secure deposits for our depositors. Not just with FDIC insurance, but we have lots of processes and systems in place to make sure that our depositors' money is safe. Is safe. And like I said, today we have about 300 million in assets. We have almost 280 million in deposits. And we have a lot of deposits currently in our bank that are over the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit, meaning they're uninsured. But people still feel comfortable enough because they know that we're running a safe and sound institution. So they're placing faith in us to protect their money. So most banks take those deposits and then they loan them out. Typically they will loan them out 
to whatever their core banking products and services are, whether it's mortgages, consumer loans, auto loans, uh, small business loans, commercial real estate loans, any kind of a loan, we take your depositor money and then we loan it out to someone else in the community to buy a house, grow their small business, invest in themselves, buy a vehicle, whatever purposes they need to borrow money for. And then whatever the difference in cost between the cost of those deposits that we take in and the interest that we earn on the loan is, that difference is, the, generally speaking, it's the gross profit that we make. Banks have also historically made money on fees, right? So a lot of those accounts, those deposits, are very costly for a bank to have. For example, if you have a small account, let's say with $500 in it, that account uh, has compliance costs, has staffing costs, has insurance costs, has the cost of sending out statements, cost of issuing the debit card, cost of monitoring that account, and then you know maintaining it and reporting on that account. So all those costs um, are frequently offset with some fees. So some banks will charge a monthly maintenance fee, or they may charge an overdraft fee, which are not very popular, and um, we don't we don't like them very much either, uh, at least at our bank. But those are the fees that frequently offset the cost of providing those services. So together between the, the what banks call interest income, which is the income that we earn really on the spread between the cost of the deposits and the loans that we make, and the, the, the difference is the interest income, then there's also the fee income. So most banks make money from those two services. And there's I'm oversimplifying a little bit. There are other ways to make generate fee income, charging for services that banks provide, or selling mortgages and receiving a fee for originating and selling the mortgage, or doing government guaranteed loans and selling those and making fees off of them. But generally speaking, the banks set their uh, fees and set their interest costs based on their business model, whatever their business model is, and it's different from every uh, every bank. There's no single two banks that are identical in what they charge, what they pay on deposits, or what they charge on their loans. That making sense? Yes, sir. All right, so what makes one bank better than the next one? Again, it goes back to uh, what the core mission of the bank is. So I'm not sure better, you know, what I would ask is how would you define better? Is it better for the community? Is it better for the shareholders? Is it better for the customers? Is it better for the employees? You know, what are those definitions of, of better? I will speak to our goals. How do we want to get better? And we're not necessarily benchmarking ourselves against other banks exclusively. You know, the way we measure uh, what makes us better for our communities or what we strive to make sure that we are better for our communities than some of our other banks is our intent. Are we intentionally serving more underserved people? than our peer banks. Um, I will also ex maybe add to this, just to put it in context. We believe that every healthy, vibrant community needs to have a range of financial service providers. Needs to have the large banks, the medium-sized banks, the small banks. Needs to have the minority-owned banks, the community development banks, the locally community-based banks. All of those banks are critical to viability of any community. Why? Because they all provide different services. We're not trying to serve every person with every product they need. There may be products and services that we may offer you that may not be a good fit for someone else or vice versa. Or there may be a frequent situation. I will tell you, just this morning I was talking to a customer who received an offer from another bank for a mortgage. And he sent me the, the term sheet that him and his wife received. And I told him candidly, this is a great deal. You should go with the other bank. Now, why would I say that as a banker? because we're different. We're not just trying to serve everyone with everything if it's not the best thing for them. So that's how I measure our effectiveness. Are we finding the very best service and product for every customer, regardless where they're on their wealth building journey? And sometimes that means sending them to another financial institution. Even though we give up that customer, we still don't give up the relationship because guess what? This person, six months from now, 
he's going to come back when he needs a new work truck because I was honest with him and I helped him get a better deal. So now we've built trust, we've built a relationship. And so we're that kind of an institution. So to, uh, it's a very long answer to your very seemingly simple question, but a very complicated uh, question is, we want to make sure that we're the best for our communities and our customers that bank with us. Not for everyone, but the people that, that bank with us, that choose to bank with us, and the communities that want us to be there, we want to make sure that we're maximizing our positive impact on that community. Why do some banks provide loans um, while others may deny someone who has the same criteria? Great question. Uh, that's another thing that separates us from a lot of the other financial institutions. So I frequently get this question, especially by national media, that are asking, what's different about you being a minority-owned bank and, and a community development bank? And, and the difference for us is the way we evaluate every person is not any different than any other bank. So those basic, basic principles of banking that have proven to be um, good predictors of one's ability and willingness to repay is the five C's of lending. So your credit, which means your credit history, your capital, how much capital do you have as a person or as a business, your cash flow, can you service uh, the debt? Do you have the ability, do you have the income coming in to pay the loan? Uh, then it's your collateral. You have the collateral, whether it's uh, you're buying a house, is the house worth what you're financing or what you're, what you're paying for it? And then it's character. Character is the toughest one, right? because how do you evaluate one's character? The way we look at it is we look at the person's really willingness over their history to pay their debts. That's not a simple answer sometimes because we all Lead, lead different lives and have different challenges in our lives and some of us struggle, some of us go through life changes that may cause us to not be able to make payments for a while. And there are all kinds of challenges. So what separates us is we take those five C's of lending and we apply what I call a six C for us and that's compassion. So we operate on a six C model, not five C. That six C is what makes a difference. So I'll, I'll get to your question um, indirectly a little bit. If you look at our credit performance, the loans that we make over the last five years, they outperform most community banks in terms of the quality of the loans. So you should ask, so how can you be a mission-driven bank and make credit available to these underserved communities and people and still lose less money? The, the simple answer is we work a lot harder at making that loan work for the customer than many of the large institutions. And then I'm not saying they're worse or better. Their model is different. So our model is to focus on closing the gap. So if a person comes here and they need to borrow $50,000, for most banks, uh, if you need to underwrite a $50,000 loan, you're probably going to spend so much time that the customer will never be profitable for you because it takes hours and hours of analysis and the, and the old saying in banking frequently used to go you know if you need to borrow fifty thousand dollars you're probably not qualified if you need to borrow fifty million dollars you're probably qualified I don't believe that's true by the way but what what is true is that that fifty thousand dollar borrower is going to require a lot more support frequently than that fifty million dollar borrower and so to answer your question now directly why do some banks approve customers and others don't is because every bank has a slightly different criteria that they're willing to accept. Uh, for I'll give you an example, uh, it's very specific. Just yesterday in our loan committee, we looked at a, a loan that was a very long-term fixed rate loan. The customer is very strong and very credit worthy, but our risk tolerance is not such that we could offer them credit because what they were offered by another institution was much more longer term uh, fixed rate loan that we're not comfortable with as a smaller bank. That doesn't mean that we don't want to serve the customer. It doesn't mean we even decline them. We just said we cannot offer you that particular structure of a, of a loan. That's why I believe we need to have a vibrant and diverse, robust financial ecosystem where you have mission-driven black-owned banks like us 
but you also have larger banks that may have the ability to make those types of loans. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, what I believe, uh, why we're critical to this world is because of going back to the 6C. So we take the extra time to make a loan work that may not make sense for a large institution. But we also make those larger loans because then you could ask the next question would be, well, how can you have a viable business if you're spending 10 times as much time on individual small loan that most banks would not even touch because it's so small? You know, how is that viable? How can you actually pay your people to do those loans where they're not going to make you any money? The way we do it is we, we support it with larger loans. So we just make a decision. It is our mission to serve everyone, regardless where they're on their wealth building journey. And we're going to work just as hard on that $50,000 loan as on that $50 million loan. And the way we make it work, we receive a lot of support, right? So what makes our business model work is we receive a lot of mission-driven individuals who have plenty of choices to either invest their capital somewhere else or do banking business with someone else because of our core mission of making those loans that most banks would not make. They choose to join us. So that's that model. Essentially, it's a cross-subsidy. We use the, the larger loans, the larger relationships, and the impact investors that we receive to support our core mission, which is to make loans that most banks wouldn't touch. Very complicated. So <laughs> I just ran through 20 years of my learning here in about five minutes. All right. So this question is kind of complicated. Yeah. So as a college student, um, I'm kind of learning how to be financially independent. I just opened my own bank account. Um, so like, what's your suggestion for college students who are wanting to build wealth um, for their future, but also for someone who doesn't have credit and wants to build being, being focused and disciplined and, and, and setting aside whatever surplus you can generate. And every person, regardless of their financial situation, can save a dollar or two or 20 or 50 or whatever a week, right? Being disciplined enough, I would advise every college student to try to live debt-free, try to accumulate as much as they can in early, early days when they're still forming their financial habits and their spending habits. Not spend every dollar that you have over once you've earned but set it aside, create a separate savings account at a different bank or even at the same bank, but forget it's there. And every month when you have a little surplus, put your surplus in that account. And you'd be surprised what you'll have when you, when you are um, finishing school or getting ready to go to graduate school. The last thing I'll share on that, part of our mission, yeah, you're gonna get more than you bargained for with, with, with that, that early question you asked. But when you think about what separates a person in America from moving up the socioeconomic ladder or staying where they are, it's not what kind of a job they have necessarily. It's not even what their credit score is. Um, it's not even what race they are. Although that plays, as we know, that plays a huge role in it. it it's not what gender, what school they went to. The number one predictor of one's ability to move up the ladder is the wealth of their parents. Right? Which is a little depressing, right? Because if you're born into a low wealth family, then your trajectory in life is going to be, statistically speaking, I'm not saying they're not winners who, who, who exceed their place in, in, in life that they, they were um, given in, in a way because of the, the socioeconomic system that we built. There are exceptions to it, right? Everyone celebrates Sam Walton and Mark Zuckerberg and everyone else, right? There are exceptions to that. But ultimately, the wealth of your parents is what determines the frequently, statistically speaking, I'm an exception, you're probably an exception, you'll be wildly successful. But what bothers me about it, that how come in the greatest, most powerful country in the world, you have to beat the odds to be successful, right? So, so what I want for my children and every child in America is to make sure that they can have a good life that they've earned but they don't have to beat the odds to do that. So now that the bank has completed its first 100 years of completion and in respect to COVID-19, how do you see the bank evolving in the next century? We believe we are building on the legacy of the very courageous investors and founders, which included Modeska Simpkins over 100 years ago and we believe we're just getting started. So the way I see 
the first 100 years of really hard labor and vision that our shareholders, um, from our founders to our chairman Mitchell today, have really built a, a foundation that we have to use as a foundation, that we're just getting started. And what I mean by that, uh, over the last really year or two with the pandemic, most mission-driven banks and community banks have really experienced resurgence of interest because the communities that they serve realized that they needed a locally accountable institution. When I was sitting in this office in March and April of last year and the bank was officially closed, uh, you know, we have people banging on our windows wanting to come in and get help. We answered their call. We met with them physically or virtually and help them get, whether it was the PPP loans or other support in the middle of the pandemic. So the community has really started to rally around us in a way that I've not seen before in my, in my history and career. Um, so that provides a unique opportunity for us to really build on that. So you have a wonderful 100-year legacy of, of very courageous, visionary African-American leaders and investors combined with the new energy and also accentuated by the murder of George Floyd. You know, I would say that more so than ever before, our communities and our stakeholders and corporations and people around the country no longer can hide from the fact that we have deep systemic disparities in this country. No one can credibly argue that we can keep going as we have been going and things are gonna work out okay for everyone. That, that, that's over. Um, uh, two or three years ago when I was making the case for the bank and begging people for deposit money in our little bank, you know, it took, a, it took an hour to convince them why our bank is important. Now that conversation is about a minute long because they've seen how black businesses were shot out during the pandemic. They've seen how George Floyd and millions of other Americans are treated unfairly. So they can no longer argue that we're important as a mission-driven black-owned business, that we're important for our country as, a, as an economic floor for our country, we are critically important. So the next 100 years, I truly see as an exponential growth for us. Um, I wanna see us become one of the top five largest banks in the world. I, I think we should have a $100 billion black-owned bank. I think we should have a black-owned bank on every in every major market in America, should have one. Doesn't have to be Optus could be another bank. I believe our future is such that we eventually don't even distinguish whether our bank is black owned or white owned. Just a mission driven bank, just a bank that's serving the community, the whole community, and serving it not exclusively, but inclusively. And so that's my, my uh, naive belief, is that we can build an institution that helps continue this movement that was sadly started by the pandemic and George Floyd's murder, but create a movement out of that that moment to transform the way capital flows into communities and homes across this country. And I think we're at the beginning of it. Well, Mr. Mayorkton, we thank you for you know, taking time out of your busy schedule to come respond to these questions um, that your customers may have and have never asked. Um, and sitting next to you today, um, I really appreciate your transparency to the questions um, and that you're doing something. Um, to create change in the African American community because there's a long list of problems that exist um, and being a part of the change is important to me. Um, and I know when we edit this and make it all pretty and put it on the internet, your customers in this community will appreciate it as well. Well, thank you. No, it's been an honor and I just look forward to seeing the product. And remember, if you would like an opportunity to be a part of the Spotlight series, send us an email at spotlight at carolinapanorama.com and our team will get back with you shortly to ensure that you have an opportunity to answer the most client-demanding questions. Thank you.